Who? All right, good. good. All right, good morning. Welcome to, uh, where are we, Cleveland? <laughs> Great opening joke, right? Yeah. So thank you guys for, uh, for coming to our, our talk today. Uh, this, I am uh, Tim Medine. Um, I own a, a security consulting company. Uh, I've do, been doing pen testing for a number of years. I uh, teach with SANS. I'm Ein's faculty, the program director for SANS. This is uh, Derek. Derek will introduce himself. Hey, everybody. I'm Derek Banks. I work for Black Hills Information Security. I don't own my own company because that's hard. <laughs> so I just work for a company. I'm a pen tester ma mainly, uh, previous blue team, and then I came over to the dark side because there were cookies. Good deal. So um, again, thank you guys. Thank all of you for coming here. What we wanted to go through today is, you know, some of the, the simple things that we've we've seen kind of over the years. Everybody likes to focus on the really hard, the real difficult attacks, but let's be honest, that's not where all these things are happening, right? Um, so many of the, the hacks and so many of the, the honestly the kind of cool stuff that we see is we try the really simple, the really dumb stuff first. Everyone's kind of trying to shoot for that, you know, that next generation bypass and all sorts of craziness, but realistically, it's these simple, simple little things. So we encourage you, you know, be a little bit lazy. My first programming class, I was in eighth grade, Mr. Kaler, and he had this big, you guys remember the track printers? Yeah, those things were awesome, right? Like you could print banners. So he had this banner, it's like uh, something like the best programmers are the laziest people or something like that. My mom was pissed. And she's like, oh, don't be lazy. I'm like, no, mom, but you're, she's like, no, 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 don't be lazy. But so much of what we do, that laziness sort of helps, right? Because we end up, like, I'm, I'm not going to do this again. Let's automate this. Let's try the simple, the dumb things first, because oftentimes they are going to work. And this very much aligns with APT, right? You guys are all familiar with APT? Right? APT is the Advanced Persistent Threat. If you've read any breach information, one of the APT groups is the people that have done the hack. Right? It's, it's never actually Steve in his mom's basement. It's always the advanced persistent threat because no one wants to admit they were attacked by something really dumb. Right? Advanced persistent and threat. Oftentimes that threat is not very advanced. Their persistence is, is not really there either. And they're sort of marginally a threat. Key one here is Equifax. All right, I sort of hate to pick on them, but it's, it's, it's a cool story because it's relevant. But between the time when that vulnerability was disclosed and the patch was released, and when the breach was detected, how long was that? Like, like five months? It was a number of months, right? And we see this breach after breach after breach where someone is popped with an old vulnerability, something we have known about for, year, for, for months or sometimes even years, and that ends up being the way in. Is that advanced? Not really, right? It was just, you could just, any script kitty could run some of the code. Is it really even persistent? Right? Are they really trying if it took them like four months to get in? Right? Not, not, not really. And then we see this time after time after time. And we see people trying to defend against the latest and greatest things, but they're missing some of these really simple type things. Well, if I've learned anything in my years of information security is that phishing is the most advanced attack that an attacker can pull off, right? Uh, every time you hear in the news, this is the most advanced thing we've ever seen, so it's always phishing, right? Why? Because it works. So phishing must be hard to, to, to configure, right? To pull off. What's the first thing you need to have if you're going to if you're gonna launch a phishing campaign? A domain? It's real hard to find a domain, right? So it's real easy to go out, register a domain, um, you know, you go and do something like uh, securemessaging.companyname.com. Well, that might not work to get through an email or you know an email gateway, right? So, what can you do? You can go find something that's already categorized. There's a site called expireddomains.net. You get a categorized domain that's expired. It's already got reputation, and you can use that for your phishing campaign. So, how do you send the emails? It's hard to set up an email server, right? Everybody runs their own email server. 
Well, it turns out that uh, services like uh, Office 365, Yahoo, they're actually kind of a bit permissive in what you can send. I mean, does anybody think in Office 365, if I tie my domain to you know, their service, I can't send macro-enabled documents, right? Oh, what, yeah, yeah, I can, right? So do you think that the email gateway is going to trust you know, the reputation of what I'm doing? Absolutely. And then on the flip side, if I want to set up a command and control channel, you know, if you have a, a, a proxy, you're probably doing categorization blocks, right? No, the same thing works there. If I have a, a domain that was already categorized, it sails right through. This is really hard to do. It takes visiting a website and spending $10. So here's an example. All of these were categorized as something like business or IT. Totally worked. So it, to, just, to, just to touch on that whole phishing thing, we tell users over and over again, do not click on blank in the email. Fill in the blank. No, seriously, have you guys not heard this before? Don't, don't, yeah, anything, right? Don't click on links in email, right? Now, I hate email to start with, but we tell users over and over again, don't click on links in email. Any of your organizations use secure email? What is in 100% of secure email? The link. Link or an attachment, right? So we're like, okay, wait. Don't click on links and attachments, but wait, 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 wait. Unless it's a secure or really important email. <laughs> and then we're confused when people open the email and they get, they get popped, right? So we had some of this. We actually ended up with the expired domains going through, finding previously categorized thing, literally anything with the word message in it, and then you fake that secure email, right? Because we got this mixed message. Don't click on links. Well, unless you kind of sort of have to. Got it? No, of course, people absolutely don't. Unless it looks legit. Oh yeah, unless it looks it. legitimate. <laughs> right? And these days, you know, even the bad guys coming from, you know, pick a, pick a random country, they can use the grammar checkers and they get better and better, right? Uh, Windows Defender, this, was, this, this has, has uh, since gone away, but it was one of my favorite things. I think uh, maybe the two of us were working together on this one, actually, at the time. We had a Cobalt Strike. You guys familiar with Cobalt Strike? Love me some Cobalt Strike. I hope I keep hoping if I say that enough, they'll give me a free copy. Because <laughs> buy a car, or I can get Cobalt Strike. I can feed my children, or Cobalt Strike, <laughs> one of the two. Um, anyway, so we copy and pasted the payload into an Excel document. Uh, I tried to save it, and Excel is like, "Nope." I see what you're trying to do here. Something here doesn't look good. Now, I could try the hard method of reverse engineering. Like, what's the check? Like, which piece of whatever is in here is the piece that's bad, right? Like, I can remove lines of code and add lines in and try to change it and do weird things with the case. I am kind of lazy. So I got a little bit, what I did is I ended up copying and pasting the whole thing. I copied and pasted it into uh, line, or, uh, cell A12. And I told Excel, hey, when you launch, run what's ever in A12. And Windows Defender's like, oh, fair enough. Looks good, right? Like, there was no reverse engineering needed. This was like this simple, lazy thing. Now, this lasted about six weeks or so before they uh, started not knocking this out. But try this simple, stupid stuff first. You're going to save yourself a bunch of time. And it's just, you know, just kind of funny, too. In case anybody can't notice, the text is white. Oh, yeah. And turn the text white so they can't see it. Totally safe, right? Yeah. So how many people in here have some advanced uh, you know, endpoint protection something, cyber APT blinky box agent on your endpoints? Yeah, yeah, OK. So do you guys want to see how I use a really advanced technique to bypass one of these uh, uses AI to catch the next generation of zero day threats? This is, this is really advanced. I used NCAT. <laughs> no, seriously. They, so this particular one was Silence, and uh, the uh, the engagement was not a red team or a pivot. This is something that we we do a command and control test. So we try and run different uh, 
levels of sophisticated malware to get past uh, you know, whatever endpoint protection is on the box. And Silence was actually doing a pretty good job with a PowerShell that I had. I had a, a C-sharp wrapper with some shell code. It caught it. I'm like, oh, that's actually really awesome. And then I, on that machine, went with the browser to the MMAP project and downloaded NCAT and shoveled a reverse shell. Silence, yep, that's cool. So I, I wonder a lot uh, as a pen tester, and I, when I do get caught by these kinds of things, do the security vendors really focus on pen tester and pen tester tools, or do they actually catch bad stuff? So it's been my experience actually using something custom or using something that isn't, you know, Metasploit or PowerShell Empire or Cobalt Strike, it tends to go through. This is, of course, a really simple example, but hey, I had a shell out of the network. Yeah, we're switching back and forth. We got this. We've done this before. <laughs> All right. So, um, you guys familiar with Spectre and Meltdown? Somebody want to come up here and explain it to us real quick? <laughs> yeah, uh, Spectre and, and Melt, uh, Meltdown. It was uh, the branch prediction. It was that process vulner processor vulnerability. Like I've watched presentations on it. I've read about it. I still think I get about maybe five percent, and I might be exaggerating on that number. Um, but it, it, it's really cool. I understand what it does, but the actual details of what goes inside the processor is, I'm pretty sure, dark magic. Like, I think outside Intel, they have a series of kittens that they just sacrifice to keep that dark magic going year after year after year. Um, but anyway, right after this came out, I had a number of clients come up to me like, Tim, what should we do with Spectre Meltdown? And I was like, uh, honestly, you should uh, change your password policy. And they're like, Tim, I don't think you understand this. And I'm like, well, I, I don't, but I don't know. They're like, no, 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 you should, you should change your password policy. And they're like, well, Tim, that's, that's, not, what, that's not what Spectre and Meltdown are. They, they don't really have anything to do with that. Why are you recommending this? And I said, well, because I ended up getting your organization with crappy passwords. You're focusing up here when you've got gaping holes down here. Right? You're trying to like patch your entire network with emergency patches instead of making just some basic hygiene changes that are going to help keep some of the bad guys out. So traditionally, over the years, um, how long have auditors said that we have to change our passwords? We have to rotate every how many days? 90 days. Do you guys know why? Well, you guys didn't, probably didn't know this, but when Moses came down from the mountain, he had a third tablet. On that third tablet, it was, you should change passwords every 90 days and don't click on links and email. This is really important, right? No, but we've had this, this sort of concept. Don't we have to rotate every 90 days? Why? Because in the 70s, it took 90 days to crack a password. Now, out of curiosity, how many of you were born after the 70s? I shouldn't even ask this. <laughs> oh, God, That's really so, depressing. I feel so old. Oh, terrible. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so in the 70s, it took 90 days to pa crack a password. These days, we've got you know, the water-cooled, GPU-powered password cracking rigs where we can get billions of password cracks per second. We have things like pass the hash where I don't have to crack it. We have mimic cats where I can get it in clear text. We also have a cool thing called the phone, where you can ask people for their password and they'll give it to you. Right? So we've got this whole concept of this password rotation policy every 90 days. It's designed to stop a breach. According to the Verizon breach report, how long is it between a breach happens and when it's detected? Six months. It's about six months. How many rotations is that? Two. But I can pretty much guarantee you, at no point in time, was Vladimir in the Ukraine go, oh, come on, we screwed now. They changed password. Right? That's, that's my terrible Russian accent. I will offend all of you at some point. Right? How many of you do pen testing as part of your job? How often have you been like through your probably one week or two week engagement where someone changed the password? You're like, oh, we're, we're, we're done now. Right? This doesn't happen. So people, they end up getting to this, this idea that, you know what? We should change password because it makes us more secure. 
And then we've got these complexity requirements, right? Uppercase, lowercase, number, and a special character. Any of you ever worked the help desk after a, a holiday? <laughs> oh, you know what I'm asking next, right? What's the phone call you get like 100% for the next four days? What's my password? Can you reset my password? Right? And, and they hate calling IT because we get tired of answering that question. They feel dumb asking, so they come up with really smart ideas. Smart in non-secure ways, but sort of ingenious nonetheless, right? They're looking out their window, they're like, oh man, it's snowing outside, and coming back after Christmas, not really here so much, but like in other parts of the country, there's snow on the ground, I can't remember my password, and then 90 days later, they see like, you know, the flowers coming up. 90 days later, it's, you know, hot outside. They're like, man, the only way I could just look out my window here at work and remember my password. <laughs> right? So they look out their window right now, and they're like, oh, it's, it's spring. I got capital S, lowercase, pring. It's like, oh, it's not long enough. And I can't repeat the last 472 passwords I've had. And ideally, there's going to be a spring next year. So I need a way to differentiate this spring from next spring, and I also need a number. So the users sit there for 45 minutes to an hour to figure out what this number might be that will distinguish this spring from next spring. And then they end up with, obviously, spring 2018. Oh, but now we might need a special character. Exclamation point, right? <laughs> and then in 90 days we have 90 day fall. What happened to your summer, dude? <laughs> yeah, 90 days later we have fall, autumn. It's, it's twice as hard that month to guess, right? Uh, but, but we see this time after time after time. I cannot tell you how many organizations I've gone into, and I'm like, look, I'm just going to try a simple password of spring 2018 across your entire environment for every single user. And I've had people tell me, like, oh, it's not going to work here. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Do you have a technical limitation? They're like, no, we told people not to. I'm like, gotcha. You want to bet a stake on this? Right? And I try this across the environment. I get credentials, and we I clearly I don't lose many stake bets. <laughs> Not that funny of a joke, <laughs> right? Like, like you know, this 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 type of stuff happens over and over and over again. So we'd like to change some sort of technical thing that says, you know what? We're going to actually look at this password, and it has a season and year. Sorry, we're not going to allow it because every single one of those entropy checkers tells you that it is a super secure password. Spring 2018 bang. But every single bad guy and pen tester in the face of the planet is trying Spring 2018 right now. Right? So we need some sort of technical, limit, te te technical implementation to prevent those kinds of crappy passwords. Because they work over and over again. Derek and I were working on an assessment, and we, got, we were having a terrible time. And like, in the middle of the engagement, I'm like, does anybody need a sales engineer? Because clearly, I don't have this technical thing nailed down. And then like, the next week on a Monday morning, Derek texts me. He's like, hey, remember that, 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 that other client we were working on? Yeah, I got in spring 2018, single factor authentication. Uh, then used Kerberosine to get a whole bunch of service tickets, and then I asked if I could put it in the slide deck, and I did. Yeah, so when I Kerberosed, I went to go crack those passwords, and um, I, how many, do you want to guess whether or not the, I was able to crack any of those 48 tickets? No, those, those service accounts had super great passwords. Look, when... When there's an eight-character password policy, when I get into an environment and I see there's an eight-character password policy, I giggle like a schoolgirl because I know, unless there's only five users in the environment, I'm going to be able to take advantage of that. And I use super sophisticated tools to do this. Um, for this particular one, um, I used a tool that was already built uh, by someone at Black Hills uh, called Mail Sniper. I took the tool and I pointed it at uh, their OWA server and I, I hit tab and for the parameters and then I filled in the, uh, you know, the right values and it totally worked, right? Um, so bad passwords are one of those things where we can't harp on it enough. And every time you tell an organization, you know, I, I got in because I used a great hacking tool called a browser 
and was able to you know, guess a password. I mean, that's actually happened to me before where I had email addresses that I, I gathered for a company and I went to their customer portal and they had username enumeration uh, that they were vulnerable to and I used some of their employees' email addresses and I guessed company name 123 and I got two people I could log in to their customer portal. Oh, man, you know, sometimes it, it's just too easy, right? There was another time uh, where, <coughs> excuse me, another time uh, where me and a, another Black Hills guy, we were on an engagement, and we were able to guess uh, passwords for users and, and get into their their O365 uh, environment, and so we wanted a VPN in, and so we started searching through their mail for things like VPN, and. We found that they were emailing back and forth in the clear uh, uh, certificates to put into their endpoint, their uh, your, their client VPN solution, and so we went and downloaded that client VPN solution, and installed it, and put the certificate in place, and were able to VPN in. That was terribly difficult to do, and then we noticed that they had SharePoint in the cloud. We can get into that as well, right? So sometimes it's just the easiest things that that work. Cool. So uh, there are so many resources available for us. People, and it's one of the great things about our community, right? Like we see so many people, they, they find a cool bug and they blog about it and they walk you through step by step on what they did. And we've got a ton of resources where people will do the same thing with the CTF. Here's the CTF challenge. Here's my thought process as I've gone through it. And some of the really good ones will show you Hey, I tried this, but it failed. And we can use those as, as a way to develop ourselves. You know, you can literally grab that same tool, that same binary, that same, you know, device, and actually walk through some of the same stuff because people share so much. That's one of the fantastic things about industry, right? You don't see other organizations and other industries sharing you the internal details of what they do with their product. And people here, we share so much. So I have a friend of mine, uh, he, bought a, he bought a web camera in 2012, 2011-ish. Bought a web camera. And he's like, you know what, I hear this IoT thing. Actually, I don't think IoT was a term yet. Um, but he had this camera. He's like, you know, well, let, let's, let's take a look inside the binary. So he had this fantastic walkthrough on what he did to look inside this firmware. So we bought this TrendNet camera in, uh, uh, this, in 2011, did the blog post in 2012. And he walks through using Binwalk. Now, how many of you have heard of or have used Binwalk before? Okay, a few of you, fantastic. Uh, but back in those days, Binwalk wasn't nearly as full-featured as it is today. So what we had to do back in those days is we had to divide up the, bin, the, the binary file ourselves. It would show you where the headers were, but you had to do some of the manual extraction yourselves. And he walks through these steps where he carves this, this binary, this, this firmware. And then he looks at the file system. And it turns out it's just a Linux type file system. And he looks in this directory called server. In the server directory, now this is a web camera, there's a directory called a nani. Guess what a nani stands for? Anonymous. So he goes back to the web camera, browses to uh, CGI bin anani mjpeg.cgi, and now he has access to the camera. No authentication required. And there are thousands and thousands and thousands of these things all over the internet. People have them in their houses, their kids' rooms, all sorts of weird places. Like there's one in like this creepy, like, I don't know, I think it's the place where they, it uses the lotion. <laughs> yeah, it was creepy. And I'm like, I couldn't stop watching. I'm like, I want to know what happens here. I'm going to regret it, but I want it. Yeah, so weird stuff all over the place. So I'm like, you know what? I want to try some of this too. So I bought my own web camera, different brand, and walked through. So some of these same simple steps. Use Binwalk, found the headers, extracted, and I looked at the file system. Now, on a Linux file system, what is one of the first files you should, we like to look at? Etsy password, right? In the olden days, Etsy password actually contained the password hashes. 
But because any user that has access to the system can read that, we've realized that that's what we call a bad idea. So we move those, pass those password hashes into another file, typically our, our shadow file. Now with our IoT type devices, we've gone back in time. And those password hashes go back into Etsy password. And they're oftentimes not properly hashed, not properly secured. In fact, I've seen them sometimes in clear text. Or they're encrypted with base 64. Okay, and in the, the example I had, it, they, this password was encrypted with base 6, the passwords were base 64 encrypted. Now, base 64 is not encryption. Encryption requires a key, but I was able to decode these passwords and read through it. I looked through it and it was like user one, root, factory test. Look back in the interface, user one, root, there is no factory test. Log into the device, factory test exists. So there was a hard-coded credential inside the firmware that's just simply extracting, looking at literally the first file I should look at, finding this credential and access the camera. And I was able to, you're able to do that, and you can bypass all the authentication on the camera, make any changes that you want to on the device, and view the video feed. It took about 37 seconds to do all of this. I ended up contacting the manufacturer, and I'm like, you know, I would, you know, I. Anybody else like money? <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I like money. Right? We should hang out. Maybe get a lot. All right. Um, there is. This was before big bug bounties were really big. So at the time, you couldn't just say, "Hey, do you guys have a bug bounty program?" You also should not call them up and say, "Hey, I've got a bug. Pay me, or I tell the world." There's a technical hacking term for that. It's called extortion. <laughs> yeah, so what you do is you use some more legalese, like. How would much would you how would you compensate for the exclusive disclosure of a vulnerability in your product? Right? And I ended up getting, I think it was like three or four thousand dollars for this. And it took me, no joke, about two minutes to to do the uh, the actual hack, if you will. And it was literally a hack by numbers, and then looking in the first file we should look at and extracting the information. And so much is like this, where we just try the really simple, dumb stuff and it ends up uh, working for us. One of my other favorite bugs, this is literally my favorite bug of all time. How many of you have children? How many of your children like ice cream? Like two, two hands? Then your kid's like, oh, oh my gosh, you're terrible parents. <laughs> anyway, we, we've all had this happen, right? Like, the kid comes up to you, he's like, Dad, can I have some ice cream? No. Can I have some ice cream? No. Can I have some ice cream? Later. And I know what that means, Dad. Oh, God, no. Can I have some ice cream? No. No, no, no. Can I have some ice cream, Dad? No. Can I have some ice cream, Dad? No. Can I have some ice cream? Right? And eventually you're like, fine, just eat some freaking ice cream. This is the can I have some ice cream, Dad bug. The, it's my favorite bug of all time. Literally, you could authenticate to this, this, uh, the SQL server, uh, my SQL server, say, hey, can I authenticate? No. Can I authenticate? No. Can I authenticate? No. No, no, no. Fine. You tried hard enough. Here you go. I also call it the soccer trophy authentication. I was like, good enough, Tommy. You, you can have access. You tried, right? I don't want to hurt your feelings. But literally, with this flaw, one out of 256 times, it's like, ah, fair enough. You're in. Yeah, beautiful bug, right? And it was, I, I ended up contacting this guy, and then the Cisco auth bug. There was a, a, an SSH authentication vulnerability with Cisco devices, where if you had a private key, it was like, oh, you're good. Any private key. <laughs> it didn't even have to be shaped like a key. If you had a file that said, this is my private key, the device is like, oh, okay, you tried. Like, I, I see you have a key there, you know, you, 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 you're in. And I, t I actually emailed with this guy, like, how did you find this bug? Because we're like, did you virtualize the Cisco device and then, you know, reverse engineer it? He's like, don't tell anybody. But I accidentally overwrote my private key, and I was able to authenticate. I was like, oh, <laughs> that's pretty elite, right? So he smashed his authentication credentials and was still able to log into the device. Right? So these, again, just these simple sort of bugs. Um, I think the, the issue with this one was the, uh, it was identified, someone was running a scanner, and the phone scanner said it was able to log in, and this dude wasn't able to log in. So he rage scripted some authentication. He's like, I'm going to try this over and over again. 
It's like four, one in a billion. Log in. It's like, no, no, no. Okay, fair enough. The device is like, yeah, you're, you're in. So we're kind of related to that. Try the simple stuff. Try the, try the, 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 the really kind of dumb stuff. Don't be afraid to go sort of low brow. Related to that, learn from the new people in your, that, are, your, your, that are around you. It's really easy for us technologically advanced people to show off. Let me show you how much of a badass I am. Because they might come into, your, come into your office, your cube, call you up, and be like, hey, look at this cool thing I did. And then you being the badass, you're like, yeah, but here's a cooler way to do it. They're only going to come to you so many times with their great ideas when every single time you squash them and show them a better way to do it. And then, you know, it's, it's nice to be helpful, but celebrate with those new people. And they're going to come up with some of these really weird, interesting bugs. They might come up with a really simple, dumb approach. And I found that. I, sometimes I'm up here, and someone's like, hey, have you tried, you know, just logging in a thousand times? Why would I do that? Oh, it worked. Okay, fair enough. Right? Don't be afraid. Use those. The new people can be extremely valuable. They give you a different perspective on this. We end up staying with this really high technical stuff, but use that, use that knowledge of these other people, especially their different industries or different backgrounds. You guys want to add to this? Yeah, and uh, I think we said in the uh, description that we were going to tell you some of the things that really frustrate us as penetration testers. And I'll tell you, it's not uh, the, the cyber blinky box stuff. It's not really any kind of specific tool. Um, me, we talked about passwords. If you have a big, pa a long password policy, like 15 or more characters, I really have a bad day. I really don't like that. Um, so another thing, uh, if you don't allow your workstations to talk to each other, you know, have like Cisco uh, private VLANs or use the Microsoft firewall, if I get on a box and I can't, and I have credentials and I can't talk to anything but servers, I want to cry. Um, like really, because that, that's a really bad day. Uh, the times that I've been caught, um, actually my first three years at Black Hills, um, I kind of was getting a little depressed uh, because I thought, man, this is not getting better. This is really easy and um, wow, um, no one is doing a good job anymore. Um, but then this last year, I started getting caught more. You, you want to know what was catching me? Endpoint log monitoring. The companies that were looking at what was happening on their endpoints and having someone pay attention to that, alerts for things that aren't normal. Like, how many people run net commands normally in your day-to-day -day job? Nobody. Guess one of the first commands I run when I get on a box? Net commands, right? So if you uh, are logging uh, what's being run on the box, you know, commands that are being run, and you alert on a net command, I mean, that might not mean that something bad is happening, but it might mean something bad is happening, right? I had, uh, anytime there is a, a team that has come up with something creative, like I had a, a um, you know, how many people have Sims? Or, well, I, a couple of people, I know you do. Uh, so, uh, I, <laughs> so I, I had a company that their, or, their, their management wouldn't let them buy a SIM until they instrumented appropriately. They were using uh, Microsoft's uh, secure SCCM and playbooks to basically take everything off their endpoints and, and they wrote playbooks to look for uh, you know, anomalies on their endpoint. Not a security product, really. And uh, they caught me in 15 minutes. So yeah, those are the things that, as a pen tester, and attackers are going to do the same kind of things. If you have an attacker on your box or in your network, they're going to start running commands that your normal user won't run. Yeah, and related to that, it's, it's again, we like to focus on those really high-tech, huge vulnerabilities, but oftentimes it's the simple things. Like, my users aren't, you know, Steve in accounting doesn't run the net command. Right? Why is Sally in marketing all of a sudden running PowerShell? These With are, are encoded different. Encoded PowerShell. Encoded PowerShell, right? Can she read that encrypted PowerShell? Sort of uh, related to this, this is taken from a, a CTF, that a, a class that I teach with SANS. Um, and it, it's, it's really funny because it's designed, it's a level one question. There's four, there's four levels, and it's, I think, the third question. And it is designed to be really, really easy. So let's just walk through this from a very simple perspective. First off, what types of characters? Now focus on the characters, right? Baby steps. Baby steps here. What types of characters do we see? Uppercase, lowercase, numbers. Uppercase, lowercase, numbers, right? There's equal signs at the end. These are not trick questions, by the way. 
Um, right, uppercase, lowercase, numbers equal signs at the end. This is indicative of what? Base 64, right? Base 64, we've got uppercase, lowercase, and numbers. 26 plus 26 plus 10 is uh, 50, 62. And then we've got the plus and the slash. And we might have additional uh, equal signs at the end for padding. And we may or may not have that. Similar to base 64, we have base 32. It's a slightly smaller character set, but the same sort of thing. So you make sure that you go through with those baby steps. Because I ended up spending about, I think it was like six hours, trying to base 64 decode something when it was actually base 32. I didn't take that, little, that step back and that baby step. So we see that the people in, in the class, let me uh, flip my screen here. So I use like my, my, one of my favorite decoders here is uh, Burp. So in Burp, here's my base64 coded string. I can simply say decode as base64. And now I get this next string of text. And this is related, no joke, I've seen this same sort of encryption technique um, with some, um, is a web service for a mobile application. And they were using this to, to sign their payloads. Yeah. Um, anyways, so what kind of characters do we see here? Hex characters, right? This looks like 0 through 9, A through F. So again, use my handy dandy tool, burp. So we'll say ASCII hex. And then we end up with this. This is where things go sideways in my class. So I see the advanced people. They see this, like it's, it's shell code. Right, so they rip this out, they open up IDA. Like maybe, maybe there's, you know, there's encoding techniques to make this not work as well in IDA. So let's try Hopper, let's try Redair. Let's try Binary Ninja. Or maybe we have to XOR it with something else to try to figure it out. And they go into this deep, dark, rabbit hole of sadness for the next 45 minutes. <laughs> and it's hilarious because I can tell the advanced teams because they're stuck here. Meanwhile, you know, Joe Schmo, who is, this is their first class they've ever taken, it's like, well, burp works twice. Don't fail me now. So they literally come back over here, they're like, I don't know, maybe it's URL, maybe it's something else. And they literally try all of the options, and they finally get to gzip, and it's like, huh, something weird showed up. And you can kind of see this. It's so funny when it happens, because you got these advanced people, and like, you can see like, you know, brain fluid dripping out of their ears. And like this total noob guy is like, hey, I, I got it. And they're like, what'd you do? He's like, that little drop down, I just clicked on it a bunch of times. And they're like, right. <laughs> well done. Um, so we end up seeing this. This is what kind of character set? Looks like hex again. Decode as ASCII hex. And we've got a lovely Rickroll. OK? Yeah. Um, but, but no joke, I've seen some of these, these uh, things like this. Related to this, I, I see this all the time, especially with the more advanced people. When they get stuck at a problem like this, they don't ask for help. One of the most empowering things that I've, I've, I've sort of had, I've literally had to train myself to do is say, I don't know, please help me. It's hard. I have my own company. I teach classes in front of thousands of people all over the world. Like I, I, have, I, I run a, with a part of the program for the master's program at SANS. Walking up to somebody and be like, I have no clue what I'm doing. Would you help me? That's freaking hard. But to be, to, be, to be honest with you, people come up to me all the time and they ask me about some of the work that I've done, like with Kerber roasting and stuff. If you walk up to somebody who has done some sort of technique, by and large, they are thrilled to talk to you. Because you're taking an interest in their hard work. And they have a passion for whatever they did. Be like, you know what? Let's sit down. Let's do this right now. I would be happy to walk you through step by step exactly what I did. Or point you in the right direction. Hey, check this out, check this out. People in this industry are very open and very sharing. If they're not, forget them. Right? If they're a jerk, it probably means they don't know what they're, what they're talking about, and they're just pushing you aside because they don't want to reveal it. Find somebody else. There are tons of people in this industry that will happily help you out. But you have to be willing to say, I don't know. Or somebody come help. Right? Oh, that was awesome ending. Very dramatic. <laughs> so related to that too, uh, teach others. Right? We, as you learn something, 
uh, I used to do this at, at a company I, I worked for in Minnesota. We would sit down at lunch and we'd be like, hey, here's this cool thing that I figured out. There's a fantastic um, group in Dallas. We call it uh, Dallas Hackers Association, DAHA. There's another one in Austin, AHA, Austin Hackers Anonymous. And there's others all over the place. Uh, but what we do is we encourage new people to show up and just get up in front and talk for five to 10 minutes about what you're working on. Is it going to be the latest and greatest leap thing? No. In fact, I hope not. It's interesting to see people work through their path. And we'll sit down and grab a beer afterwards, and we'll talk about it and come up with new, different, interesting things. And then someone will come up and show their really interesting uh, t talk. Come and do some talks at conferences like this. Will your first talk suck? Absolutely. freaking -lutely. My first talk was horrible. I got diarrhea of the mouth. It was a 60-minute talk. I finished it in 23 minutes. And what's said is, like, during the talk, I'm like, I'm going too fast. Stop. I can't make it stop. I can't make it stop. I don't know what I'm doing right now, but the words should come out faster. And it just kept happening. But you'll do enough of these talks. You'll watch the recordings. You're like, you know what? I say um a lot. I say right all the time. Let me work on my delivery. You're at these talks this week. Watch other people and be like, hey, I like what he did with his presentation. But I would encourage you, get up and present on some of your talks. I've got uh, one of the guys that uh, I recently hired in my company. He did a talk at DerbyCon on Exploitation 101. And he walked through. This is how the basics of some exploitation works. The room was packed. Absolutely packed. There were other, all sorts of cutting edge attacks going on at the same time. He had so many people come up to him afterwards. They're like, thank you for giving that talk. Like I, and they would say, like, I know it's not very advanced, but I needed that, and I was too afraid to ask other people, or I was stuck on a particular subject, and you helped me. So you don't have to walk through the latest and greatest, most cutting edge. What in the world? <laughs> I thought it was just me. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like... Yeah, well, okay. yeah so, so I would encourage you, do those talks. And again, it doesn't have to be advanced. Share your knowledge. And you'll practice some of those skills. And maybe you don't feel comfortable getting in front of people. Write some blog posts. Share that way. There are so many blog posts out there. You don't have to cover some new ta technique. Show something that you've learned and put your spin on it. Show what you learned and your, your, the, the pieces you got stuck, to, stuck on and ways you worked around it. It is very valuable. It'll help you personally. And it has the, the potential to help your career as well. And also, if you're in a, in a city or in a place where there's not a group already, there's not like you know, the, the Austin Hackers group or something, that, that was my sit, uh, situation. And I started one. And the turnout was amazing. It, I, I started a city sec style meetup, which you can go find on, on Reddit. And uh, it, we've been doing it for two years now. And um, people have gotten jobs because of coming to that meetup. So uh, I think both of us brought uh, some swag and some merchandise. Uh, we have t-shirts and stickers for you know, both companies. If anybody wants them, uh, they're free. I don't think we have enough for everybody, but you, know, you can fight over them. And everybody's scared of, of, of clicking on. Look, if I wanted to own you, that is the stupidest way possible. Which is the right? theme of the talk? It's like, let's Wait, see. Let's no. get it on video where Tim put a malicious link on and then attacked a bunch of hackers. Dumbest idea ever, right? Uh, but anyways, it's just our contact information. If you have questions, drop us an email. Hit us up on Twitter. I will respond to email. I am not necessarily fast with email, but I will respond. Okay. Uh, if you guys have questions, we'll grab questions out in the hallway. Other than that, thank you guys so much for uh, thank you all so much for attending. Uh, enjoy the rest of your time.